of you tonight. Thank you so much for carving out the time uh, to spend with us in what will no doubt be a very special evening. Mastermind Masterclass is the Alumni UBC Speaker Series, which began in our centennial year, offering students and alumni an unprecedented look into the minds of modern masters, making a unique impact on the world and the lessons they've learned. Tonight's Mastermind Masterclass is presented in partnership with UBC School of Music and is part of UBC's three-day John Corleano Festival with multiple student masterclasses culminating in the public concert tomorrow night right here at the Chan Center. And I'm told there are still tickets available and if you've enjoyed your evening, I encourage all of you who have not purchased tickets to do so and our box office has kindly agreed to remain open until 8 p.m. tonight. We want to acknowledge the estate of Kitty Heller for their generous contribution to making this Mastermind Masterclass series possible. It is absolutely wonderful to have so many fans in the audience uh, tonight. As you, uh, I'm sure, have already heard, on August 15th, we were thrilled to welcome Professor Santa Ono as the 15th President and Vice Chancellor of UBC. Professor Ono joins us from the University of Cincinnati in Ohio, where he served as president from 2012 to 2016. Born in Vancouver, his father, Takashi Ono, was a mathematics professor right here at UBC in the early 1960s, and we are absolutely delighted to welcome Professor Ono back to Vancouver. Professor Ono will be officially installed as UBC's president and vice chancellor on Tuesday in this very theater, and we extend an invitation for all of you to join us if your schedule permits. On behalf of Alumni UBC and the School of Music, we would like to take this opportunity to thank our event sponsor, TD Insurance, and a very special thanks to our webcast partner who is recording tonight's keynote, the Irving K. Barber Learning Center. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our sponsors and partners for their tremendous support. Usually we encourage you to turn off your cell phones, but don't do that. We would love for you to tweet the event at alumniubc, hashtag is UBCMMMC. I believe selfies are encouraged, so please share your evening with our online community. Uh, tonight's event is a little different from past Mastermind Master classes. Following Mr. Corleano's presentation, I will come back on stage and then we will have a short reception before inviting you back into the theater to give you an exclusive sneak peek at our dress rehearsals for, uh, for Saturday's concert. Like a dress rehearsal, John will be giving feedback to the students in between each piece. There will be two breaks where you will be able to leave this beautiful auditorium as not to interrupt the artist's rehearsal. Now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce this evening's distinguished guest. From his Oscar-winning score for The Red Violin to his opera The Ghosts of Versailles, his acclaimed Symphony No. 3, Circus Maximus, and his Grammy-winning Conjurer, Concerto for con Percussionists and String Orchestra, American composer John Corleano has built one of the richest, most unusual, and most widely celebrated bodies of work of any composer in the last 40 years. His scores, which now number over 100, have won him the Pulitzer Prize, the Grawmeyer Award, five Grammy Awards, an Academy Award, and have been performed and recorded by many of the most prominent orchestras, soloists, and chamber musicians in the world. His architectural method of composing has allowed him to forge a strikingly wide range of musical materials into arches of compelling oral logic. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming none other than the John Corleano.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I can tell you that I've had a wonderful couple of days here in Vancouver with this wonderful university working with the students and faculty. And indeed, the concert Saturday night will be quite terrific because the performance standards are so high here. I am thrilled to be here, having a wonderful time, looking for property, of course, as every other United States <laughs> person is. <laughs> um, and very pleased to talk to you tonight about one of my great loves, the architecture of music. You know, people don't think of music and architecture in the same way, but Nietzsche said, I'm paraphrasing, music is frozen architecture in the dimension of time. And if we think of that, that's really what it is. If you take an abstract that is non-vocal work, an orchestral piece, and you play for 20 minutes, you have to build a structure for that. Now, there were many structures built in the past, and they were all built based on the alternation of two important qualities that are human qualities that give us a sense of completeness, the yin and yang, in a sense, of music. And that is the idea of the repetition of something familiar that gives us comfort, and the variety of something new that gives us a sense of adventure. This is not a musical idea, this is a human idea. For example, um, if you take somebody and work seven days a week, week after week, the sense of repetitiousness incites a feeling of boredom and a feeling of discontent. On the other hand, if you take someone and you put them on a three-week cruise uh, and tour of the cities of Europe, and every day they're in a different city, I know from experience that by the third week, I and other people will be aching to get home to the security of the repetitiousness of the familiar. So musical structures are built that way too. And we build them using um, a theme or a musical idea or a series of ideas, and then finding something contrasting, and then coming back to the original idea. For example, if you look at the architecture of the Capitol building in the United States, it is a perfect example of this form. On the left and the right are similar structures. In the center is the dome of the Capitol. So if we label A to be the structure on the left, B to be the Capitol, and A, we have the most popular form in music, which is called ternary, or three-part form. So we tend to build bigger and bigger forms. I mean, the classical period, thanks to Haydn and the composers after him, built these structures of rondos and sonata allegro forms and variations and all that based on this idea of repetition and variety and repetition and variety. And they built monumental structures so big that people like Mahler in the um, late 19th century and early 20th century were able to compose a movement that lasts 30 and 40 minutes from a single structure. So I'm fascinated by this, and when I was a young composer, I started out using these traditional forms, the sonata form for a first movement of a concerto, for example, my piano concerto. Uh, the second movement would be ternary form in a sense of a scherzo, which uses that form. Then there'd be variations and maybe what's called a rondo, which is just the main idea with other ideas interposing it. And that was satisfying to me. And I did compose inserting my music into these forms. But as I grew older, I became dissatisfied with that idea, of the idea of these pre-existing forms, almost like prefabricated housing. And you put the music in and slot it in and compose your piece. So I said to myself, can I write music and build my own architecture for it? In order to do so, I have to realize that those balances have to be kept, the balance of the familiar and the unknown, uh, and that I can build any structure I want to as long as I'm really aware of the tension and release of these ideas. So I'm taking you on a journey tonight. Um, the 
percussion concerto, Conjurer, that was mentioned, uh, is a piece I'm going to talk about in terms of my composing it, my being commissioned to write it, um, and all of that. Um, taking you through the journey of how I built the structure that housed the piece Conjurer. When I was approached to write a percussion concerto, um, I immediately said no. And the reason was that I don't like percussion concertos, <laughs> which is true. Now, why don't I like them? I don't like them because I never know whether the percussionist, if I'm just listening, is part of a multi-percussion part of an orchestra because the orchestra has a percussion section in it. So when I hear an opulently percussionized piece with an orchestra, I think, gee, they must have four percussionists there working. I don't get a feeling of a soloist. My father was a soloist. He was the concertmaster of the New York Philharmonic. And when he played the violin, he was playing a concerto in which the, that little 18-inch piece of wood became the message through which he spoke. But a percussionist plays hundreds of instruments. They will whack a drum and hit a chime and then hit a marimba and play a riff and then go to bongos and then go to this and claves and all sorts of things. So it's very hard to get the identity of the percussionist as a soloist. So I resisted this. I said no. And I did that for 15 years when Evelyn Glennie pursued me to write a piece. I just said, no, I'm not really interested. Then she got together with Marin Alsop, the American, wonderful American conductor, and the Pittsburgh Symphony. And they came to me and they said, we want to commission you. And Marin said, who was a great friend of mine, said, uh, John, you have to do this. And I kept saying, no, I don't have to do this. So I said, what I'll do is I'll quote, a really high price, and that will absolutely take care of it because it will be so high that they can't do it, which I did. I quoted an enormously high price, much higher than I would ordinarily do, and they looked shocked and said, we can't afford it, and I said, wonderful. <laughs> I'm free. I don't have to solve these problems that I think are insoluble. And so it went for six months and eight months, and then about nine or ten months later, the head of the orchestra called me and said, well, we've raised the money. <laughs> yeah. And I was stuck. <laughs> Truly stuck. So I had to find out whether I could write a percussion concerto, whether I could make a piece in which the soloist was really the soloist. And the other thing I didn't like about percussion instruments is they bang and they go away. Where am I going to write a beautiful melody for the percussion? It just even the xylophone, the vibraphone, even the vibraphone that sounds fairly long, the sound goes away. So you really find it's very hard to write melodically. And you'll see in most percussion concertos that what happens is the melody is played by the cellos, and the percussionist is banging around on some drums. <laughs> Not what I want. <laughs> so what I did was I started out writing down notes to myself. And what I'm sharing with you tonight, it's going to be very distant when you see it because you're so far away from the screen. But what I'm sharing with you is the process through the originals, writing down of notes to forming an, a, an idea of what I can do to starting to write the piece after I graph it out and really know what the architecture is. So that, which is unreadable from here, that says, I'm going to read it to you because I see it here. I'm really sorry because it should be much closer to you, but I can't help that. And I think part of the problem is going to, you're going to have to trust me on this. Those are really words. <laughs> and what it says is, notes on percussion concerto, two basic problems. One, illuminating the percussionist as a concerto soloist. A. The variety of instruments played makes focus as a soloist difficult. Most percussion concertos sound like orchestral pieces with opulent percussion parts. I just told you that. B, percussionist often serves as punctuation and has limited melodic resources, so orchestra often dominates in terms of presenting thematic material with percussion serving as rhythmic interjection or accompaniment. Then I wrote two, lyrical and melodic limits. Mallets, that is drumsticks, are obviously uh, melodic on certain instruments like the vibraphone. 
timpani can play notes with the pedal. But it really doesn't work, because if you want to sustain something in the timpani, it won't last. And in the mallet instruments, what they do is they do a tremolo, a roll, to sustain a line. And I hate that. I think that's really not nice. So I didn't, didn't have any idea that that was a solution for me. So then I thought a lot, and I said, ideas on solutions to the problems above. One, restricting the orchestral palette to set off the multicolored percussionist. And this was really an important discovery to me. The orchestra is composed of woodwinds and brass and strings and percussion. Obviously, I would remove the percussion, even though some percussion concertos even have the percussion section play as well as the percussionist, but they wouldn't be there. But the winds and the brass have lots and lots of colors they can make, whereas the strings, if you notice in orchestra, the violins are the same as the violas and cellos and basses. They're just bigger examples of it. So they can sound homogenous. They can sound as one unit. So what would happen if I use the string orchestra alone against the percussion battery, battery uh, who's the percussionist. That way, everything that you hear that's percussion is the soloist. Everything the strings do is strings. And there's no other flutes and oboes and clarinets and trumpets and tubas and all et cetera to get in the way. So that seemed to me par a partial solution of my problem. Then, um, I said, what about using separate movements to isolate this large group of percussion instruments? And I had, for example, pitched and unpitched percussion. In the orchestration books, they teach you what unpitched percussion, like castanets or something like that, or claves or um, bongos. They're unpitched, they say. And pitched percussion are things like the xylophone and the glockenspiel and the timpani, et cetera, et cetera. The real problem with that is they bleed over. They don't really make sense because tom-toms are non-pitched percussions, but you can tune them to pitches. They're not exact pitches the same way the timpani is, but they're kind of pitches. So I had to discard that idea. It didn't work for me. It was too, even though I would write one movement unpitched and the next movement pitched, I thought that would be really cool. But out it went. My next idea was a little better, in fact, much better. I said, what about dividing into three parts, the three basic things that percussionists hit? Wood, things made out of wood, like a marimba, like, um, as I said, castanets or, or um, temple blocks or all sorts of things that you hit that are made out of wood. Or, and they would be, say, the first movement, because the first movement would be very secco, very dry. Because when you hit a wooden thing, it doesn't resonate much at all. It just goes boom, and, it's boom, and it could be pitch percussion like the marimba, but it's never going to resonate and be really melodic. The second movement, I could do made, things made out of metal. Now metal, interestingly, pr provides a tremendous amount of resonance. If you think of the chimes, or you think of a tam-tam, or cymbals being hit, you see that they can last 30 and 40 seconds. So I could make a lyrical movement using metal objects, and my third would be skin, things made out of skin, all the drums, which would include tom-toms and timpani and bass drum and bongos and all sorts of things. So that seemed to be the way I would go. Um, and it would clear up a lot if I had a string orchestra and I started with things made out of wood in one place, all set up, things made of wood. Then the percussionist walks to another position and plays things made out of metal, lyrically, and then walks to a third position where everything made out of skin lies waiting for the percussionist to play. And that's the plan I finally accepted. So how to make it even clearer? What would happen if each movement the wood movement, the metal movement, and the skin movement started out with a cadenza for wood, metal, or skin. Now, what is a cadenza? A cadenza is an unaccompanied passage where the orchestra does not play. It's used in concertos all the time, from Haydn on to through contemporary composition. But these cadenzas would serve to really 
delineate the function of what I'm trying to make clear, that this wooden object thing can play, and then is joined by the orchestra, which is strings alone, which still gives it clarity, and plays. And then in the transition, the orchestra will play while the soloist moves to the metal. Maybe a crash of the cymbals and a, a huge gong of playing, and we're into the second movement, metal, and we can get lyrical there. And then when that's over, moves to the third station. Now these stations I can show you um, just by advancing this a little bit. That's a station or a section in which the percussionist stands and you see there's a marimba there and there's all sorts of crazy looking um, instruments here right in back of the marimba and they're all mounted claves, wood blocks, tempo blocks, mounted castanets, a coconut shell even, wood drums and a log drum, and there are 18 of them, and they are pictured this way, in the 18 lines of the two staffs, and what would happen is that the percussionist would play on the marimba, and then all of a sudden, jolt to the non-pitch percussion and jolt back to the marimba and back and forth and you can go back and forth instantly. And then here's a xylophone to give you some really high sounds. Um, that was a solution to me. That I could do that for the wooden station and then I could go and do the metal station, which is this, and again, set up in the middle with the percussionist playing several things, the um, vibraphone in the center, the crotales, I'm trying to read this because it's, it's almost unreadable, <laughs> and the chimes, of course. These are chimes, and this is a vibraphone, and these are crotales, little bells, and spend most of the time here on the vibraphone and the glockenspiel, a very high set of bells, and could play melodically. Now, about this melodic situation, how could you play melodically on the vibraphone? Well, it's a semi-melodic instrument. It's the best percussionists have for sustaining a tone, but it doesn't really sustain it that much. It comes down all the time. Bom, bom. However, there's a technique that we devised in the 20th century by using a bow and placing a bow on the end of, the, of this stick of the vibraphone and pulling down on it, we make the bow, have the vibraphone sustain a sound like a violin would by pulling this metal bar. The thing is that that sound starts from nothing and comes up, so you get Now it'll sustain that, but there's no attack. So I thought about this and I said, what would happen if with one hand the percussionist held a stick to hit the vibraphone, a mallet, and with the other hand a cello bow, and struck it and bowed at the same time. So we'd get the attack, boom, boom, and it was sustained. And I worked really hard. I went down to the Juilliard School where I teach, went to the percussion department and got them to get a student to work with me with this bowed and struck vibraphone because it was a technique that was not known to players. And it really sounded beautiful. And to boot, vibraphone has a vibrato because in the middle of the bells of resonators, there's a piece of metal that revolves around with a motor that shuts off and shuts on the resonators. So it has an actual vibrato. So it can sound very human, especially if bowed and struck. So I had my melody instrument. And I didn't really accept the commission until I knew I had an instrument that could really play melodically and I could write a truly melodic 12 minute, it turns out, movement for the vibraphone mainly as soloist, but the chimes and all these other things coming into play too. The crotales and glock and the chimes and the tam-tam, which is right over there and a smaller tam-tam over there. 
so we can get a big crash of sound, say, with the chimes and the tam-tam. But when we want to get lyrical, we can do that. And only then, when I really found I could find an instrument that was really lyrical, did I accept the commission. Now we can go back and look at these, this graph. Now this is the graph of the whole piece. This is how I write it. This is a line of intensity. So it starts out very soft, grows louder, and this is the cadenza, the first cadenza. And then there's a line separating it, and all of a sudden the orchestra comes in, and you see there's a different kind of activity, a kind of loud, sudden loud and sudden soft activity, rising to a climax and coming down, and the orchestra plays, and crash, the soloist walks over and bangs the, tam the uh, chimes and the tam-tam at the same time, producing this enormous crash. The orchestra still plays a little, trying to coax the uh, soloist to come back and play on the other instruments, but no, another crash. And then it is loud, 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 getting softer and softer and softer, and this line is missing because this is actually two pages stuck together. And so I'm sorry to say, there's supposed to be a line here showing you that this is the cadenza, and now the orchestra plays. And it reaches its peak in the softer section, and here's where I wrote a theme, and it was the very first thing I did before I accepted the commission to write a really beautiful theme for bowed and struck vibraphone. It was essential to me that this movement, this whole movement, be lyrical, and that, um, that it culminate in the climax here, which is very soft, but I put it up high because its intensity as beautiful melody is important. Only thing that accompanies that vibraphone that's bowed and struck are the cellos and the basses holding chords in the lower register. So one can really get a feeling of tranquility and lyricism, and the soloist is providing the melody. Then I called them up and I said I will take the commission. I really had to wait till I wrote that melody and devised that method of playing and devised the whole idea of strings alone and um, movements in wood, metal, and skin proportions. Now, we can go into each movement, uh, and it gets a little bigger, but not much. Um, hold on, there. This is the skin movement, cadenza and the movement. Now it says here, fast and unmeasured. So there's lots of very And there's a theme that starts off the whole piece that you can hear that is in unpitched percussion. So it has no pitches yet. It will have when the pitch percussion play it later. But it's just low high, low high, higher, medium, bottom, low high, and when you hear that, da da, da da, bum 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 bum, you will hear that theme reflected in the cadenza and also when the orchestra joins in. So there's thematic material there, and the interval of the fifth is very important because in that romantic melody that I wrote for the second movement, that interval was very important in it. So I said, let me make the interval of the fifth of that one to five scalar notes, part of every movement. And that is part of this movement too. When the strings come in, they start playing with their open fifths and they crunch, they play little crunches, and the whole thing changes to a fast, measured feeling of da 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 at the beginning, this is non-pitched. Then it becomes pitched. Then it reaches a climax and gets unpitched again. And then the orchestra comes in. And the orchestra and soloists play, getting louder and more dramatic and coming down. And finally reach a climax and come down. And here, the soloist plays a little with the orchestra, but stops playing about here, and then walks over to the next station, we call it, which is the station of the lyrical um, 
lyrical uh, metal um, instruments. Now it starts off with a crash. It says tam tam and chimes, FF fortissimo. Here it says, don't forget to write in fifths in a sense. This is the pitches that I used. And there's a crash, the orchestra comes again playing softly and another crash and now all of this is played on chimes, getting softer and softer and softer and softer until the orchestra comes in here. And the theme is played in the low register but struck of the vibraphone. And you'll hear that with the orchestra. And then the piece uses the theme and the interval of a fifth back and forth and back and forth and finally you see this P that's piano for soft and this is a crescendo to forte. It gets to really a forte again and the chimes come in like that. They come in really loud and then slowly they get softer and softer and softer and softer and finally the soloist walks over to the vibraphone, picks up the bow and the mallet and plays that theme here, and all of that is accompanied, as I said, by the lower strings only. And they finally hold the note, and we move to the next movement. Now, people have asked me, um, does it always work for you? Do you ever make any changes? You get to a place, and you don't do exactly what your graph said, and the answer is I do. I make changes sometimes. And the last movement is a case in point. This cadenza, was originally going to be for low percussion wood um, um, skin instruments, the bass drum, the, 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 the low timpanies, et cetera, et cetera. And the orchestra was going to hold a note here. And two things happened. One is I found that over this, you will notice these dots here. Over this several minutes, two minutes here, that we found that it was not logical to have the strings hold it, it was boring. So I had them play and get off and play again and get off. But what happened here was the discovery of a new percussion instrument for me. I discovered an instrument called the talking drum. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the talking drum. It's an African instrument and it actually changes pitch because it's, it's really fabulous. It is an hourglass shaped drum like that. The top has skin and the bottom has skin and they're tied by pieces of rope all the way around. And what happens is if you play the drum, you get a low sound. And if you start to squeeze the drum towards the center of the hourglass, you are stretching the skins so the pitches rise. So you can hit a pitch, boing, and rise it, or lower it, or stay the same. And so a whole lesson, bunch of lessons resulted in this. I actually, um, I actually took lessons in um, skin drumming, and I ended up writing this piece for talking drum and kick drum, which is a pop drum, and the, so the soloist has to hold the drum and kick at the same time. Then the final movement starts, and it is kind of a race. It is a race of accelerating to a peak, dropping down and having the timpanis and other instruments go, and then accelerating again and again and again to a final peak. At the end of this, Evelyn, who is a wonderful improviser, wanted a cadenza of her own. So I let her free to play a cadenza of her own, which was really stunning. And these two races you will hear as accelerations. And what you're going to hear here is the brass coming in because when Evelyn played it without the brass, what happened was the um, movement got so loud with the drums that there was no orchestra left. I mean, she could completely decimate uh, the orchestra by playing loud on the drums. So. I finally added brass just doubling at the end as an optional thing to do. And in this recording, the brass are playing it. It's actually the first time they, they played it. And I'm going to play you now the recording, because I want to play the whole recording. And what I'll do is I will get back to that chart and 
show you every once in a while where we are in it. Um, so what we're going to do now is play this incredibly brilliant recording of Evelyn Glennie. Uh, really is amazing. She's, she's, you know, deaf and she plays barefoot and hears through her feet and plays. And she's quite an astounding artist. Um, so I think it's really a great performance and I'm very honored to have her do that. So I'm going to play the music now and get back to the, um, that graph. And I will point out to you where we are at various points in it. We could roll the music.
said. <laughs> I do. I do. Thank you so much. Um, I would have loved to talk more, but there's a lot of time constraint on this because of your activities and rehearsals to follow. So uh, I apologize for not talking more, but I couldn't. The clock was, I was staring at the clock and it said I had to put on the piece. <laughs> uh, do we have time for questions or not? Ladies and gentlemen, join me once again in giving John Corleano a big round of applause. I am very impressed that you have stuck to time. That is a, a mark of a true artist there. Thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we did canvas all of tonight's attendees um, and invited all of you to pose a question to John. And as he mentioned, we are very tight on time. Uh, there was uh, one question that resonated with many of you. So I'm going to pose that question to John right now. Uh, from our audience who pre-submitted their questions. The, the top one was, John, what is your favorite piece that you have composed? Oh, that's I know it's like asking which child is your you favorite. Know, it, it is like that. And, and in fact, um, I remember Samuel Barber, a great American composer who was a friend of mine, always loved his prayers of Kierkegaard because nobody played it. And it was his forgotten baby, and he had a great love for it. And I can say that, you know, there are certain pieces of mine that don't get played that much that I love very deeply. But the real truth of the matter is, when I hear a great performance, like probably we're going to hear it tomorrow night, um, I love the piece that I heard the best. And then if I hear another one, I love that the best. I'm very shallow. I just know. <laughs> But it's true, it's true. If I hear something really with devoted performers galvanized like Evelyn did in this wonderful recording, um, then I love it. And it makes me say, oh, that's my favorite. But is that the question? <laughs> that's the answer. <laughs> was there one in particular that, that resonates to you because it was the most challenging or the one that was the most trying or difficult? Well, they're all difficult for me to write, I'll be honest with you. I, I go through hell writing a piece of great insecurity, and it looks all very nice when I can explain this to you. But the real truth is, when I start, I don't know what I'm doing, and I have to figure it out. And um, there's a lot of in uncertainty and times of great, great pain, really, starting a piece and going through the piece, and only when I'm really into the piece a lot do I start to see, ah, this is really going to be something. And then at the end I feel wonderful, and then I sort of rest a little bit and feel great, and then I feel guilty and I have to take another commission and write another piece. <laughs> That's the way it goes. Uh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, John Corleano. Uh, John is going to be back very shortly. Of course, we have a dress rehearsal that will be facilitated by our director of bands here at UBC, um, Dr. Robert Taylor from the School of Music. Uh, he will be your host for the latter portion of the evening. I can tell you backstage right now, we have got some very excited musicians, very eager uh, to uh, work with John very shortly. Uh, we do invite all of you, of course, to uh, recharge yourselves, and there is a complimentary reception uh, that will be taking place in the lobby for the next 20 minutes, and then we will invite you back for the dress rehearsal, and I know many of you, like myself, is looking forward to um, the night and to see how this uh, master artist works, and uh, personally, I'm looking forward to the firearm. I'm not sure when that will be discharged. And uh, I will tell you right now, I've never heard the sound of a firearm. Um, it, this is a first for me as well as the first that I actually had to apply for a special permit for the firearm. 
And did you know, here's a fun fact, every time that firearm is uh, discharged, it comes with a very healthy price tag. <laughs> so as I said to the, the musicians, I want to make that gunshot uh, be worth its price. So uh, we're in for a treat, ladies and gentlemen. I invite you now for a 20-minute uh, reception, and then we will convene back here for the dress rehearsal. Thank you.